Bueno, un placer tenerlo aquí. De nuevo, mi nombre es Marcela Colmenares y aquí pues está todo nuestro equipo. ¿no? La razón por la que eh, queríamos hablar con usted hoy es porque sabemos que tiene un historial muy grande como fue, fue gobernador de Puerto Rico y conoce muy bien el tema de lo que está sucediendo económicamente con la deuda y con el estatus de político de Puerto Rico en este momento, ¿no? Entonces, una primera pregunta que teníamos es, desde su punto de vista, ¿qué fue lo que causó que Puerto Rico llegase a este nivel de deuda en, en los últimos años? Cómo no. Eh, primero, gracias. Agradezco que, que vengan a la oficina. Eh, es una situación que uno puede eh, mirar el, el mal de fondo o causas inmediatas de algo que yo entiendo pudo haberse evitado. Eh, eh, pudo haberse evitado el, el no gastar más de, más de lo que recibe el gobierno. Yo creo que eso es algo bien sencillo y, y, y la crisis se empeora cuando en el año 2014 Puerto Rico pierde su crédito. Cuando las casas evaluadoras de crédito le tiran a chatarra la deuda de Puerto Rico, ahí hay una situación que, que ya es insostenible. Ahora, hay, una, hay un mal de fondo que se viene arrastrando hace mucho tiempo. Eh, y este mal de fondo eh, viene como consecuencia de que eh, Puerto Rico, lo que antes parecía que era una ventaja competitiva de Puerto Rico, eh, no ser un Estado ni ser una república independiente, sino ser un, un territorio, pues eh, eso comenzó a ser una desventaja. Me explico. Eh, Puerto Rico basó su economía en los años 50 y 60 en, en una ventaja, por ejemplo, de acceso casi ilimitado al mercado más importante del mundo, que es los 50 estados de los Estados Unidos. Eso estuvo muy bien hasta que empezaron a haber acuerdos de tratados de, libre, de tratados de libre comercio. Cuando comienza a haber los tratados de libre comercio, NAFTA, CAFTA, DR, etc., se pierde esa ventaja competitiva que Puerto Rico tenía de acceso casi único. Segundo, eh, de igual forma, eh, se pensaba que era una ventaja competitiva, trato preferencial en términos contributivos, pero también se comienza a perder por razones en realidad que tienen que ver con la situación fiscal de los Estados Unidos. Eh, ya en los 90 que empieza a apretar eh, el, el presupuesto aquí y demás. Tercero, que para una economía que todavía está en desarrollo, se le aplican unas reglas eh, y reglamentaciones federales que ya son de una economía madura. Entonces, eh, tanto el tema ambiental, etcétera, pues eh, 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 quizás se debió haber pensado que eh, eh, lo que llama en inglés one size fits all no, no, no necesariamente era, era bueno para Puerto Rico. Así que esas transformaciones, Puerto Rico no pudo ajustarse a ellas de, para poder seguir siendo competitivo y que su base, en gran medida de manufactura, pero no únicamente de manufactura, pudiese continuar eh, eh, siendo, siendo una, una ventaja eh, eh, desde el punto de vista macroeconómico. Since we know after what has happened with the economy of Puerto Rico, in this moment, Puerto Rico could go for bankruptcy, like if it weren't Puerto Rico, no? Or it could restructure its debt, but because of its status, it cannot do either. What is the option for Puerto Rico then uh, to get out of this crisis? Well, ideally, this should not have happened. Uh, and, and the problem is that when you lose your credit, it is similar to uh, when you're driving a car and you lose your steering wheel. When you lose your credit, uh, all the flexibility you had to actually restructure debt. During my tenure, we, we were restructuring debt. We were refinancing a lot of existing debt. Some of it uh, was uh, uh, with bondholders, but others was with, with other creditors. And we were refinancing that debt in a, in a organized way, but it was easier because our, the price of, of, of our funding was low because we had a, a good credit and our credit rating went up a couple of notches during that time. When you lose your credit, the cost of funding, if available, goes up dramatically. And that puts additional pressure on your liquidity. And on top of that, uh, you may even lose uh, access to the marketplace. So uh, that's why Congress at this moment is looking at uh, alternatives to provide for a mechanism to, to allow for the restructuring of debt, but also to allow for some kind of mechanism that will actually restore the rule of law in Puerto Rico, number one. 
and number two, that would uh, uh, guarantee that there's certainty for local and outside investors uh, in Puerto Rico. And, and that will actually uh, allow for market access again. And, and, and that's what's right now being discussed in Congress. Another question is, why and how has it been so hard for the U.S. government uh, and for Congress to pass a bill, um, a bipartisan bill, you may say, to find a solution to this conflict and this problem in Puerto Rico right now? Two main reasons. One is the potential presence that may be established by this. There are serious fiscal problems in Illinois and, uh, uh, and in California and other states. And if, if whatever you do with Puerto Rico may have repercussions on the municipal market across the U.S. and bring up the cost of money for every state and city in America. So, so they have to be very careful and they are being very thoughtful in, in what, what this process and what ought to be done. That's number one. Number two, you have competing interests and uh, different competing interests. And, and uh, it is normal that, that that's going to happen. And uh, uh, what Congress needs to do at the end of the day is what's the best policy. And hopefully that will be the end result of this process. One of the results of this crisis in Puerto Rico seems to have been, or there seems to be a correlation between the crisis and the immigration of Puerto Ricans to the United States. Uh, we can see at the Pew Research um, Center that last year the amount of Puerto Ricans who left the country passed 30% uh, compared to the previous year. Um, it seems like communities are finding a home in Florida, not only like New York as it used to be um, before. And and yeah, so so this this mobility of Puerto Ricans looking for a, for jobs and for better opportunities outside of the U.S. How do you think this has affected Puerto Rico? Uh, and the U.S. too. The effect on Puerto Rico is devastating. Uh, you lose uh, production capacity. You lose part of your tax base. But most importantly, you, use, you, use, you lose your future. Because a lot of people are leaving are tend to be younger. Uh, and, and so that's terrible. Let me tell you, I was once asked during my tenure uh, what kept me up at night. And I said our demographics. And at that time, to give you an example, we were losing somewhere between 70 and 100 physicians a year. In 2014, we lost one every day, 365. And in 2015, that number almost doubled. So if I was losing sleep, you know, with, you know, a lot less uh, uh, migration of, you know, of physicians, for example, I can't imagine how people are must be feeling right now. Uh, in during my my term, in addition to lowering taxes to try to, for example, keep physicians in Puerto Rico and unique physicians to treat people uh, people's health, uh, we we approve homestead legislation so that uh, they would be able, be able to protect their primary residents uh, from any any type of litigation. Uh, we uh, also approve partially tort reform so that uh, they will be able to practice uh, their profession, uh, not having to care so much about potential litigation. Uh, and, and, uh, and so these were some of the measures that we were trying to make. And also we made it a uh, case to deliver to Congress and to the executive branch here, the White House and the Health and Human Services Department, they need to increase funding in Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and actually, that was achieved. Uh, in, the, in the case of Medicaid, we, we achieved uh, additional funding, but only for a window, a period of time, nine years. And that will be coming up in about a year and a half that will expire. And, and that's a, a serious problem. I will be, I say it's it's a cliff that's coming up and needs to be addressed also by the executive and, and legislative branches here. Part of the previous question, I also asked what impact do you think Puerto Ricans are also having in the United States. Oh. We've seen the negative impact for Puerto Rico, uh, of course, because they are leaving the country, but how about the positive impacts for the United States of receiving these Puerto Ricans? Well, you know? uh, Puerto Ricans are mm -hmm. American citizens by birth. Uh, so uh, that means that we can work in any line of business, whether it's defense-related or, or you, know, you name it. 
same, same, by the same token, uh, our license uh, and, and many professions tend to you know, serve in, in, in the rest of the country because we're part of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has a need for bilingual professionals uh, in many areas. And, you know, the Hispanic community is 17% of the population, over 55 million strong and growing by leaps and bounds. So in that sense, Puerto Ricans uh, are, are, you know, uh, being able to provide those services in a bilingual way uh, to, to a lot of people. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're talking about police men and women, uh, you're talking about physicians, you're talking teachers, you're talking, you know, uh, uh, engineers, lawyers, you name it. And I believe in that sense, uh, uh, we've come to fill a gap that perhaps was there to provide better services to that portion of the community that's almost one-fifth of the United States already. As we know, there was a referendum, uh, if I'm not mistaken, while you were governor. Yes. And the majority of the people in that time supported statehood. Yes. Could you let us know, ever since then, what has happened with that situation? Uh, we understood you were standing for statehood. Yeah. Um, are you still supporting that? Of and could you explain to us a little bit? Sure. If you go to the U.S. Uh, Constitution, there are three different potential status that are envisioned under the Constitution. And in terms of the relationship between that entity and the federal government, the entity could be an independent republic, or they could be a state of the union, or could be a territory. We are a territory, and as a territory, we uh, Congress has the ultimate uh, word on everything, uh, if it wishes to. Uh, the Founding Fathers, when they drafted the, Con the U.S. Constitution, uh, were thinking of the territories west of the original 13 colonies, that they didn't have enough population, a strong enough economy, and, and they needed some time to organize themselves and grow so that they could eventually aspire to become a state. So territorial status was always meant to be a transitory status. Puerto Rico has been a territory since 1898. So it's been 120 years almost, and, and Puerto Rico is still a, a, a territory. The Founding Fathers never intended for any any territory to remain terri in a territorial status for 120 years. And, uh, and on top of that, we are American citizens by birth. So you wonder, uh, and, and not only American citizens, we have served in every war since the First World War, many times in greater numbers proportionally than the 50 states. So we have earned our place in the fabric that composes our nation. And uh, I believe this is a civil rights issue. It needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. I understand the immediacy of the fiscal crisis that Puerto Rico is, is facing uh, and, and why it needs to be you know, uh, uh, dealt with. But I believe the problem uh, at the end of the day has to do with that uncertainty that is created uh, and different st a situation that's created by a territorial status and it needs to be solved sooner rather than later. And what is stopping more that transition beyond the crisis? Is it political forces in Puerto oh, Rico? Oh, yes. or in, in, in Puerto Rico and in the mainland, okay. uh, both. Uh, uh, the current government in Puerto Rico does not support statehood, rather stay as a territory. Uh, and, and if you have the elected officials of Puerto Rico not supporting the status in, uh, of state, in the, even though it, it won that vote in 2012, you know, I, I don't, I, I cannot blame many members of Congress for not wanting to move forward. But the truth of the matter is that the will of the people has been uh, uh, clearly stated and, and it should be respected the same way it ought to be respected with any uh, American citizens residing in any of the 50 states. And I have just a couple of more questions for you and then we'll be um, done with this interview. Um, and this is more of a personal question. And we were thinking, uh, at the IQ Latino office before, you know, when someone like you becomes governor or someone becomes president, you know, is there a moment in their lives when they just realize, hmm, like maybe I should run for office, you know, maybe I could be the person who solves this problem. So with you, 
did you have that moment maybe when you were young or later in life where you, when you realized that you wanted to be part of the change in your in your state or well i i always character? i i always uh uh was interested in policy and, and the right policies and how they could change or alter for the better the quality of life uh, and, uh, and i was a strong supporter of statehood because of that and, and so on and so forth so i was very active but it didn't occur to me that i would end up running first for the u.s congress and later on for governor uh, and things evolved in a way that uh, were not planned and they just happened and uh, ended up you know where i ended up However, never forgetting where I came from and, and the fact that, you know, I, I will go back to my law practice and that's what I do. I was a corporate lawyer for many years and gone back to doing that. Uh, and that's what I do now. Uh, so, but that doesn't mean I'm not interested in what's going on in Puerto Rico. I'm very much interested as well as what's going on with the Hispanic community in the, in the rest of the country. And um, I remain active uh, for that reason. Would you ever consider running again? For, for no, I believe I believe you know you need to have a, a, a renovation in, in those positions on a regular basis and uh, you know I, I I think serving for eight years is plenty and it's time for you know other people to take over and, and, and do what they need to do if I can be helpful I'll be more than happy to be helpful for, in a different role all right. Well, thank you so much for sure. being with us today. It's really nice from you to receive you receive us in your office. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you.